good spirit in this place on this morning with everything that people have been exhorting in the atmosphere. It just lines up with the things that the Lord has put in my spirit for today. Amen. And so uh, we're going to lift our Bibles in the air and go forward with our Bible declaration. Let us declare. This, this is, is my Bible. Bible. This, this is my sword. My instructions for life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I shall hear it, receive it, apply it, and obey. Share it with others who don't know the way. My heart is open, so have your way. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. In Jesus' name, I'll never be the same. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. Father, I ask that you just uh, continue to uh, rest in this place today, Lord God. Be with us as we get into the word of God. Father, allow it to be like fresh manna, even if it's a word that we've heard before. Uh, give us a new rhema from the word that is going to be delivered. I pray that everyone in this room is blessed by this teaching, as well as those that may be tuning in via live stream or periscope. Father, we ask that you just simply have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You all may be seated. I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Uh, and we're going to look at verse 22 and 25. And uh, this is a passage of scripture that's familiar to anybody that's been in the body of Christ for some time. Amen. Uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Once you are there at Matthew chapter 12, I just want you to simply say, I have the word. I have the word. Amen. Bless the Lord. It's so nice for us to be on one accord when it comes down to the word of God. And the word simply says, then one, in verse 22, then one was brought to him who was demon possessed, blind and mute. And he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. How many of y'all know that in any environment, you always going to have somebody that's going to run their mouth, right. somebody that's going to always question something, somebody that's going to always have something negative say. Amen. And so we know Jesus was doing a great work, but the Pharisees was always on the sideline saying something about this and that. And he knew their spirit. He knew their thoughts. And so Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. They were trying to make it seem like Jesus was a devil casting out a devil. Wow. Why would the devil destroy his own kingdom by doing something like that? Amen? Amen. So that's just straight foolishness. But what he was talking about was that anytime a house is divided, anytime there is no unity, guess what? It's going to come to desolation. It's not going to stand. It's not going to prosper and do what it's supposed to do. And so a while back, I taught a message called protecting the quarterback at all times. Amen. Talking about protecting your pastor, protecting your leader. Well, today I want to talk about a teaching that the Lord had me to teach before, but I'm teaching it again today. And many of you I know did not hear it. Some of you have. And if you did hear it, you probably don't even remember it. So guess what? I'm believing that it will be fresh to you on this morning. But I'm not talking about protecting the quarterback today. I'm not talking about protecting your pastor. Somebody say protect, protect. your church. Your church. Can we say that one more time? Protect, protect. Your, church. your church. And so think about this for a moment. If somebody talks badly about your church, Honestly, how does it make you feel? Because think about it. You always got people that got something to say. Yeah. And sometimes you may overhear conversation. Or you may, you know, say something about your church. And next thing you know, somebody coming out the side of their neck with some type of negativity. You ask yourself, how does that make you feel? Being as though somebody talk about your church. 
If you think about your own personal family, if somebody talked about your mama, y'all know back in the day, you talk about somebody's mama, you gonna do what? Get into a fight. Yeah, Batman, Batman hit my hand, nothing. As soon as you say something about my mama, then that's a whole nother story. And so when somebody talk bad about your mama or whatever, and guess what? Let's just be for real. And if it was the truth, <laughs> what they said, you still ain't like them talking about your mama or your daddy or your sister or your friend. One thing about it, sometimes you got a sister. I can talk about my sister, but you can't. Okay, you can't put your lips on her like I can put my lips on her, amen? You don't have that right, that power, and that authority. And so it's, it normally makes you feel a certain type of way. And so if somebody tries to hurt or harm someone in your church, one of your brothers and sisters in Christ, you got to ask yourself, how does that make you feel? Because when I'm talking about protecting your church, I ain't talking about the building. That's right. We are the church, amen? And when you think about it, my focus right now is on MBTT Ministries. See, every member needs to protect their local assembly. Everybody in the body of Christ needs to protect the body of Christ. Amen. The church as a whole. But I'm talking about your family that you see on Sundays. Your family that you see on Wednesdays. Your family that you see on outings and different things of that nature. If somebody try to hurt them or harm them, how do you feel about that? And then if somebody tries to cause division in your church, how does that make you feel? Because we know it's about unity. We know it's about oneness. But if you can discern spirits that want to come and try and cause division in your church when there should be one spirit, how does that make you feel? Even when she was talking today about uh, individuals coming in and feeling the love, one of the things that really blessed me when I was over at Pastor Farmer's church uh, not long ago when I ministered there, there was a point in time when he was exhorting in the service and saying some things that he talked about his journey. And he was like, at one point in time, he had went to a church prior to coming to uh, our church, I think maybe once or twice or whatever, but something took place, and guess what? He ain't never go back. And he said it was his wife that found this little church in this building that she had to catch an elevator to get to the service, and y'all know we was on the fourth floor. But he said his wife found this church, and she started going, and she kept going. And she kept going, and all this time he wasn't going. Then all of a sudden, his motive was, let me go and check this place out that got my wife's attention. Because sometimes you can come for one reason, but how many of y'all know God got another plan? Yes, and so in the midst of him coming to check out this place that keeps getting his wife's attention, he said one of the things that he experienced when he walked in that church was love. He experienced genuine love in the church and from the people in the church. And that is so important. And so when you have people that are of one mind, that are on one accord, and when there's truly unity in the house and not division, anybody that enters in will be able to really feel that strong love to the point that they know I can't come with no foolishness up in here because they are on one accord. And so... Individuals could talk about your church or try and hurt somebody in your church or try and cause division. The individual could be a member of the church. It could be somebody that's a member of the church or it could be a person that's not even a member of the church. And so sad but true, people can be a member of a church and talk bad about it. It's your own church, but you can talk bad about it. Amen. You can talk about the pastor. You're a member in the church. You can even talk about the pastor. You can talk about the other members. Guess what? How many of y'all know it happens all the time? All the time. Just be honest with yourself. <laughs> People of God, you done talked about your brother or sister before. Let's be for real. You have talked about me before. Hello? Hello? Hello. Don't get quiet now. Just say amen. amen. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth that'll make you free. Hallelujah. But you got to understand, members, and, and it's just the reality, people will talk about the folks, they'll say things about the pastor, they'll talk about the members, it happens all the time. And so members, oftentimes, will listen to this negativity. See, sometimes you allow somebody to speak so much negativity in your spirit about your church, or about your brother or sister in the church, or about your pastor, they can speak so much negativity that you get to the point, all of a sudden, you looking at your church, 
You're looking at your pastor or you're looking at sister or brother and so-and-so side-eyed. You're looking at them a little funny when at one point in time you never did. But all of a sudden you feel in some kind of way and it ain't because of nothing that you experienced yourself. All because of some seeds that were sown into your spirit. Amen? Amen. And so when you love something or when you love someone, you will do whatever is necessary to protect it. And so if you love your church, if you love your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, then guess what? You should do whatever to protect it. That word protect, it means to cover. It means to cover. And I think about on Friday night when we was here. And we was just worshiping this place when Apostle Spence was here. And I was over here and I was just having a time with the Lord. And next thing you know, I know Angelita and, and Mary was around me. And then in the midst of me just having a time with God, I believe it was Angelita that was speaking out of her mouth, speaking and declaring that we will cover her. You know, we're going to cover our pastor. And that thing stood out to me. Amen. And so when you think about that word protect, it means to cover or shield from exposure. It means to cover, it means to cover or shield from exposure, injury, or destruction. It means to guard. And so you people of God need to understand that it is your job to protect the unity of your church. It's your job to protect the unity of your church. Again, God wants unity and oneness in the body of Christ. Unity is the soul of fellowship. If you destroy it, you rip the heart out of Christ's body. It is the soul of fellowship. Good koinonia, unity. But I'm telling you, when there is no unity, when there is great division, it is devastating to the heart of Christ. And so God loves his church and he wants his church protected from devastating damage that is caused by division, conflict, and disharmony. I want to read this passage of scripture in the New Living Translation. So you may have to pull out your phone or your tablet, but I want us to look at Numbers chapter 16. Uh, and I'm going to uh, start at verse 1. Numbers chapter 16, reading this from the New Living Translation. And I'm going to start at verse 1. And I want you to keep in mind that God wants us to be on one accord. And anytime there is anything in the midst that tries to break up the unity and the division, the unity in the house, it can be devastating and damaging. And so let us examine how division amongst God's people can really upset God. Are you there? Number chapter one, amen. New Living Translation, amen. And so it's talking about Korah's rebellion. And it says, one day Korah, son of Ishar, a descendant of Kohath, son of Levi, conspired with Dathan and Abraham and the son of Eliab and on the son of Peleth from the tribe of Reuben. They incited a rebellion against Moses. Who was Moses? Moses was the leader of the children of Israel. When you think about it, he was like the senior pastor because he had Aaron and Miriam that was with him as well. Amen? But he was like the senior pastor, the one that God gave the assignment. And so they incited a rebellion against Moses. Guess what? Along with 250 other leaders. Because how many of y'all know sometimes people want you to jump on the bandwagon of where they are with their mess? Yes. Uh -huh. They got issues with somebody, then they want to gather up their crew. Sow negative seeds to turn the hearts of other people against a person that they have an issue with. So guess what? Korah was the one that had the issue. But here he goes. He want to get in this person in, 
Then he want to say something to this person and say something to this person. So it says, along with 250 other leaders of the community, all prominent members of the assembly, all a part of the church. They came together and they united against Moses and Aaron and said, you have gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord. I'm anointed too. Hello? You got to understand the spirit that's coming. And so the reality of it is, guess what, people of God? We are all anointed. We all have different assignments. We all have different callings. We all have something that we're supposed to do in the kingdom of God and in your own local assembly. But here it is. They come together. You have gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord. And he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? First of all, Moses never act like he was greater than the rest of the Lord's people. He just knew his assignment. Amen. See, it's just important that you know your assignment. He was the senior leader amongst the people. And there were certain things that he was called to set in place. And guess what? They had issues with it. And so the bottom line is no matter who you are, you got to know your assignment. It doesn't mean that you think you're better than anybody. The senior leader of any ministry or organization is not better than anybody. Because guess what? They can't have church or run an organization without you. We all need each other. And so verse 4, when Moses heard what they were saying, because you know, you know, let me tell you something. Guess what? Sometimes a person don't have to be in your presence to hear you. That's right. See, one thing about it, God oftentimes will allow your leader to hear you without you even speaking. God will allow your leader to discern where you really are, even though you try to put on a mask. So we need to understand that. But it says when Moses heard what they were saying, he fell face down on the ground. Then he said to Korah and his followers, tomorrow morning, the Lord will show us who belongs to him and who is holy. Basically, God is going to deal with this mess that you are bringing forward and trying to uh, 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 claim that is taking place. It says the Lord will allow only those whom he selects to enter his own presence. Basically, it's going down. Cora, you and all your followers must prepare your incense burners. Light fires in them tomorrow and burn incense before the Lord. Then we will see whom the Lord chooses as his holy one. You Levites are the ones who have gone too far. He basically said, no, you trying to say I don't went too far. But no, it ain't me. It's you. And God is going to show you in the end who really went too far. Verse Eight says, then Moses spoke again to Korah. Now listen, you Levites, does it seem insignificant to you that the God of Israel has what? Chosen. You weren't left out because God chose you. It says, does it seem insignificant to you that God of Israel has chosen you from among, among all the community of Israel to be near him so you can serve in the Lord's tabernacle? And stand before the people to minister to them. They had an assignment that was not like those who were just lay people in the congregation. They had an assignment. They had a role. And so it says, the Lord is the one you and your followers are really revolting against. He said, it ain't me. You're coming against God right now with what it is that you're doing. You're coming against what God has set up and put in place. It says, for who is Aaron that you are complaining about him? Because how many of y'all know a person can have an issue with you? Next thing you know, anybody else that's close to you, they're going to have an issue with them too. <laughs> he like, what Aaron got to do with this? I mean, for real, your issue is with me. Well, why are you hating on Aaron? Why are you hating on this person? They ain't do nothing to you. And so it goes on to say, verse 12, then Moses summoned Dathan and Abraham, the sons of Eliab. But guess what? They replied and said, we refuse to come before you. He want to he wanna meet with him. He want to talk with him. No, we ain't coming. These are individuals in his congregation. <laughs> 
and he's trying to meet with them. And the thing is, we refuse to come before you. Isn't it enough that you brought us out of Egypt and a land of flown, flown with milk and honey to kill us here in the wilderness and that now you treat us like your subjects? See, see, guess what? It sounds like to me that these individuals had some problems with submission, submitting to authority. When in actuality, there are certain things that are set up in the kingdom of God, in the house, in your local church. Amen. And, and that thing is you brought us out here to die. Why? Just like the scripture said earlier today, we need to learn how to wait on the Lord. See, a lot of times we're impatient. If God speak a thing, it's going to come to pass. And God declared that they was going into a land flowing with milk and honey. They may not have gotten there yet, but it did not mean that it wasn't going to come to pass. But sometimes people get impatient, and in the midst of them getting impatient, they begin to complain. They begin to murmur. And so he goes on to say, what's more, you haven't brought us into another land flowing with milk and honey. You haven't given us a new homeland with fields and vineyards. Are you trying to fool these men? We ain't coming. So basically, save your conversation. Then Moses became very angry and said to the Lord, because how many of y'all know as a leader, sometimes stuff get to us. Hello? Oh, the word says be angry, but sin not. And so here it is. Moses is dealing with this foolishness, and he a little upset. And so it says, you know, Moses became very angry, and then he had a conversation with God. It says, do not accept their grain offerings. Anything they bring, don't even listen to them. This is with Moses. You know, just shut them down, God. Just shut them down. That's what he's saying. Do not accept their grain offerings. I have not taken so much as a donkey from them. And I have never hurt a single one of them. He's pleading this case to God. And Moses said to Korah, you and all your followers must come here tomorrow and present yourself before the Lord. You, Aaron will be here also. You and each of your 250 followers must prepare an incense burner and put incense on it so you can all present them before the Lord. Aaron will also bring his incense burner. So guess what? They did what they had to do. They prepared what they had to prepare, and it got to the point, go down to verse 25, because I ain't reading it all, but 23, it says, and Lord, the Lord said to Moses, tell, then tell all the people to get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abraham. Sometimes when you discern the spirits operating on individuals to try and cause division, and rebellion, the Lord says, get away from them. Because he told them, tell your people to get away from them because I'm about to deal with them. And so it goes on to say in verse 25, so Moses got up and rushed over to the tents of Dathan and Abraham. Because guess what? Rebellion can be contagious. Again, I said all of a sudden you get the wrong words being spoken into your spirit. All of a sudden you're looking at people different. All of a sudden you're feeling different about your church. All of a sudden you're feeling different about your pastor, whatever the case may be. Because guess what? Some seeds were sown into your spirit. And so God is like, no, no, no. Get away from that. Because it will affect you if you hang around it long enough. And so Moses got up and rushed over to the tents of Dathan and Abraham, followed by the Israel elders of Israel. Quick, he told the people, get away from these tents of these wicked men and don't touch anything that belongs to them. If you do, you will be destroyed by what? Their sins. It's been times I said in some places, I said, you know what? I got to get up out of here because if the Lord come through this place right now with the wrath of God, I ain't trying to be in the midst. Because sometimes you don't have to be on one accord with a thing, amen, but you could just be uh, uh, in the wrong space at the wrong time. Yeah. We see it all the time. Innocent bystanders are taken out all the time because they happen to be in an environment where somebody may have had a hit out on one person, but because they was in the space, they got affected mm -hmm. because they was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Sometimes in the natural sense, you are not warned, amen, about where you are. But sometimes spiritually, God will speak to you and say, I'm telling you, you better leave them alone. I'm telling you, you better get away from them because I'm about to deal with them. And if you want to continue to stay connected to foolishness, you're going to end up dealing with the consequences that I'm about to bring on them. And so he said to them, he said to them, uh, in verse 20, and Moses said, this is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things that I have done. For I have not done them on my own. If these men die a natural death 
or if nothing unusual happens, then the Lord hasn't sent me. I ain't God's holy man, he's saying. But if the Lord does something entirely new and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them and all their belongings and they go down alive into the grave, then you will know that these men have shown contempt for the Lord. Guess what? A lot of times our minds can't even imagine this taking place, right? But we see it happening all the time. You have seen major sinkholes open up. You have seen earthquakes take place and the ground has split and people have been totally destroyed because of it. So what you actually see taking place in the scripture is the ground going to open up. I looked at a, a video, a picture on Facebook this week down in North Carolina at Fort Bragg or one of them places where the guy took a picture of the road. And if you would have been driving on that road and that road split the way it did, and you drove on it and it split while you was on it, you would have went down deep into the ground and may not have even survived because guess what? We don't know how deep the sinkhole really was. But what you saw was a big open gap on the road. It happens. But in this situation, God supernaturally did it, amen, because he was dealing with the rebellion of Korah and the people. Verse 35. The fire blazed forth from the Lord and burned up the 250 men who were offering the incense. The bottom line is, when you look at the scripture, God did exactly what he said he was going to do. He opened up the ground and in went those individuals. Amen. And so, when you think about it, that's just a, an example of the devastating damage and, and effects that is caused by division, conflict, or disharmony. And so God's word instructs us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. You don't have to turn there. But the word of God tells us to bear with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We have to bear. What does that word bear mean to you? Put up with. Deal with. And the only way you can deal with people is in love. Bear up one another in love. Endeavoring, purposing to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And so let's examine some ways to keep the unity and peace in your church. Amen. First of all, focus on what we have in common instead of our differences. See, we're not going to always do things just alike. But we can't allow our differences to cause us to hate our brother or sister because they don't think like we do. They don't act like we do. They don't, you know, you may get Lunice up here with her calm spirit as she leads us through the word. And you may get somebody like Mary that's on speed. And the word of God says... We're different, but you can't allow the differences to cause you to become divided because we're not all the same. And so we have to respect that. Can we do that, people of God? Yeah. Can you respect that the one sitting to the left or right of you is not like you? Yes. They're not like you. And guess what? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. The problems that we have in any relationship, whether it's a marriage relationship, whether it's friendships, or whether it's with your relationships with your brothers and sisters in Christ, most people have issues with people when they cannot respect that somebody's different from them. Amen. They yes. think different from them. They do things different from them. They feel different from them. And so, focus on what we have in common and not our differences. It's sad, but the body of Christ is divided over petty stuff. Petty. And it ought not be so. The body of Christ in general, but sometimes within local assemblies, you have people that are divided over petty, petty stuff. And it should not be so. And as believers, we got to understand, we share one Lord, hello, mm -hmm. one body, one purpose, one Father, one Spirit, one hope, one faith, one love, and one baptism. And all of those things mentioned is written in the Scriptures throughout. 
You'll find throughout the scripture where it's constantly talking about being one. It's constantly talking about unity. Amen. And we have to be mindful of that. And so let us remember as people of God, we're one body with many members. This is the local church. One church right here. One body, one church with a whole bunch of different members in here. But we're still connected. And so God made us different. We have different personalities, no doubt. We have different backgrounds. We have different races, amen? We have different talents. We have different gifts. Guess what? Different preferences. And so the bottom line is we need to always keep that in mind because, again, it's your differences that can cause division if you're not mindful of it. We should enjoy the fact that we're not all the same. Hello? What if everybody was like minister folks? I mean, come on now. No, no, no. We couldn't have that. One of her is enough. (laughs) That senior is a handful. (laughs) And so the bottom line is, we should enjoy the fact that we are not all the same. Please understand that God wants unity, not uniformity. Amen? Amen? Unity, not uniformity. And so we must learn to respect one another's difference. Conflict is usually a sign that the focus has shifted to things that are less important than matters that are important. Amen. When you find that division, conflict, and things of that nature take place, conflict is usually a sign that the focus has shifted to less important issues, things the Bible calls disputable matters. When we focus on personalities, when we focus on preferences, interpretations, styles, or methods, division always happens. That's why Paul rebuked the Corinthian church because they got to the point. He said, y'all, basically, y'all are still carnal. Y'all are talking about I am of Apollos and I'm of Paul. Y'all are straight up tripping because you are caught up in your uh, uh, preferences. Amen. Leave that stuff alone because it causes problems. Ain't no picking sides in here. Do y'all realize we all one team? Yes. Ain't no picking sides. And so, another way to keep the peace and unity is to be realistic in your expectations. My Lord. Can I tell you, oftentimes we get so upset about things when our expectations are unrealistic. Mm-hmm. Unrealistic. And so when it comes down to your church, you better have some realistic expectations. Because first of all, if you're looking for a church that's perfect, boo, you ain't going to find it. Mm-hmm. Stop tripping over the fact where, well, you know, saved people shouldn't act like that. We're on different levels. Hello? Somebody that's new in Christ ain't going to act like somebody that's been in Christ for years. Hopefully. Right. Hopefully the one that's been saved for years ain't acting like somebody that's new. Right, right. But we all on different levels and we got to understand that. And so... No way to keep the peace and unity is to be realistic in your expectations. Once you discover what God intends real fellowship to be, it's easy to be it's easy to become discouraged by the gap between the ideal and the real in your church. It's easy to become discouraged between the ideal and what's real. The ideal is how you want it to be. (laughs) The ideal is how it should be. The ideal is that, yeah, we really should be walking in unity or one accord. That's the ideal vision for the church. But then you look at your brother, look at somebody, look at somebody. Then the real reality comes to (laughs) All you got to do is look at and think about something. And the reality comes in to let you know there's a big gap between what's ideal and what's real. However, (laughs) you must still love the church (laughs) in spite of, look at somebody else, in spite of its imperfections. Because what you're doing is you're looking at somebody that's imperfect. (laughs) And we make up the church. And you need to still love your church in spite of the imperfections that's in each and every one of us. Because if you're looking for perfection, you can go to the church down the street, up the street, in another state, and some. Guess what? You're going to find the same stuff there. Yes. So sometimes, instead of running from what's going on, we just got to deal with it. 
We got to fight to protect the unity. So if we see something that's breaking up the unity and the oneness in our church, then let's do something about it instead of running. And so, you see, you got to love the church in spite of its imperfections. Longing for the ideal while criticizing the real is evidence of immaturity. Can I say that one more time? Amen. Longing for the ideal while criticizing the real, what's really taking place, is really evidence of immaturity. It's evidence of immaturity. Because you do get to a point in your spiritual walk uh -huh. when you understand Jesus' statement when he said, they, <laughs> people, will know that you are mine mm -hmm. by the way you love one another. Because he had those 12 disciples mm -hmm. from different backgrounds and all personality types and some. And I believe the Lord truly knew how hard it wow. is yeah. and, and, and was to love people. Nice. Just touch yourself and say, I'm a trip. I'm a trip. I'm a trip. And I know it. <laughs> touch yourself again and say, I think. I think. I think. I think. I'm easy to love. I'm easy to love. But everybody, but everybody don't think so. Don't think so. Yeah. Okay? And that's the truth. And so you got to make sure that you don't find yourself just criticizing. And then on the flip side, settling for the real without striving for the ideal is not good either. Because it gets you to a place of complacency when you just settle for anything. No, we all need to be striving to become better. Yes, indeed. We're not going to be perfect. But we all need to have the same mindset to be striving to be better. Instead of just getting to a point for real and we just like, that's just how she is. Mm. No, no, no. Because if there's anything we can do to help somebody to become better in the body of Christ, that's what we should do. But when you just got that mindset, you'd have given them hope. First of all, believing that God can change anybody. Mm -hmm. And look at yourself and realize he changed you. Mm -hmm. And he's still changing you. So what makes you think it's impossible for somebody else? Y'all know we get there sometimes, though. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Especially if we've seen something that's been the same way for so long. We get there in our own mind when we begin to think it's impossible. But that's when we have to take authority of our own thoughts. Got to be patient and wait on God. Because mm -hmm. it's in his timing and not our time. Oh, my God. And so we need to understand that Settling for the real without striving for the ideal is not good. And so real talk, other believers will disappoint you. They will disappoint you. Anybody been disappointed in here by other yeah. people? In your own church. Yeah. Okay? Okay, in your own church. Amen? Real talk, other believers will disappoint you and let you down, but that's no excuse to stop fellowshipping with them. Somebody said this morning, because everything in the service was lining up, but somebody said something this morning about people can do things at, at your job, but you still won't go there. Okay, Mary said that. I mean, the reality of it is you work with people all the time. And I promise you, your boss get on your nerves. That's like your pastor. Hello? Yeah. You got a boss. I promise you, your boss get on your nerves sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. when they ask you to do something, you do it, and they say, this ain't right, do it over. Oh, oh. I know you feel it. Uh -huh. yeah. I know you feel it. Now you're preaching. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I had to do, I, I shut myself down this morning. Can I just tell you? Uh -huh. I shut myself down this morning because I asked some people to come in here and do some stuff this week. So Deacon James and Deacon uh, uh, and Trainer Martin, they came in this week and they cleaned up the church real good, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and Deacon James is like, well, I, I need you to just go and see if it's, is it okay. I said, it's all right. It's good. You know, anything is better than what it was. So I just wanted it nice and clean. So this morning, <laughs> I, first of all, I came in yesterday. The chairs were turned a certain way. These two chairs. I, I, I know who turned them. <laughs> the chairs were turned a certain way. I ain't like it. <laughs> Can I just tell you? I ain't like it. And so I, I ain't say nothing. I let it stay that way the whole way. But at the end of the end of the event yesterday, I fixed the chairs back like I like them. So then this morning, I went in my bathroom. The, the rug is catacorner. Why the rug got to be catacorner? <laughs> she likes everything catacorner. So I was getting ready to call her in there like the boss and say, I know I asked you to do this, but what, you need it. Mm -mm, this right here, I don't even want this like this. So sometimes on your job, your boss can ask you to do something. 
you do it, and then they tell you, no, I need you to do this over. But I said I would, I talked to her after service, but I just talked to her in a word. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so funny because I was laughing at myself because for real, how many of y'all know that's just her preference? Yes, it it's not like it's wrong, mm -hmm. but it's just her preference. And I said, I'm about to call her in here right now and say, okay, the chairs was all catacorner. I wanted to bring in and say, this don't even look right. If I'm standing here at the sink, one foot is on the carpet, one foot is on the floor. This don't even make sense. Why catacorner right here? But I kept my mouth closed. I didn't say anything. But for real, you will have individuals that will do things that will get on your nerve. But is that a reason to leave? No. Your boss get on your nerve, you still go to work. Your co-worker in the next cubicle had a bad day and came in and took it out on you and you don't say, guess what? I'm not going to I'm not going to work tomorrow. Y'all know what? I'm sick of us having these grown temper tantrums. Because yeah. we have too many grown temper tantrums in the church, in the body of Christ. But we don't do that at work. We take it all. We take it all. We don't quit. We don't leave. We don't go run and find another job. But let somebody in your church get on your nerves. Preach. Now you ready to roll. Mm. <laughs> Gotta be mindful. So the bottom line is, again, other believers will disappoint you. Other believers will get on your nerve. Other believers will let you down. But that is no excuse to stop fellowshipping with them. The word of God in Ephesians 4, 2, New Living Translation, it says, again, be patient with each other. My Lord. This is the word, y'all. This ain't me. It says, again. And guess what? He's saying again. Why? When somebody say again, why are they saying again? Say that again. You got to do it more than once. Because they got to remind you about something again. It's obvious that he said this before, but he's bringing it to their attention again. And he's saying, again, be patient with each other. Be patient with people. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor again. We're talking today. Say, neighbor, I have to be patient with you. And you have to be patient with me. It says again, be patient with each other. Making, oh, y'all, listen to this. This is so good right here. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. That's the word. Be patient. Making allowance for each other's faults. Because how many of y'all know we're going to mess up sometimes? Mm -hmm. Anytime we got to make room. We got to make allowance because we got to understand we're human beings. We're growing. Someday we have a good day. Someday we have a bad day. Sometimes we may take stuff out on you. It wasn't on purpose. You wasn't even an issue. But the reality of it, we have to make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Church reality, it is made up of real sinners, including ourselves. Amen? Amen. We're just sinners that's been saved by grace. And because we are sinners, we hurt each other. Because we are people, we hurt each other. How many of y'all know sometimes we hurt each other on purpose? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm still praying for the major mass deliverance in this house for the get back spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Because you got some people that just, you know, oh, you do something to them, they want to get you back. It's just deep down in their soul. Like fire shut up in some people's bones. Get back and shut up in some people's bones. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is, Deliver me, Lord. we have to understand that we hurt each other sometimes on purpose. And sometimes not even on purpose. We can hurt somebody and we don't even know that we did it. A person walking around upset with you, salty with you, and some, and you try to figure out what's wrong with them. They come to find out it's you. You're like me. Well, what I do? I, I knew something was wrong. I just I 
couldn't figure it out, but you made it. It's me. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, bottom line, we hurt each other intentionally and unintentionally. But instead of leaving the church, stay and work it out, if at all possible. And most of the stuff that get underneath our skin, it can be worked out. Especially if we just talk about it, deal with it, shut the devil's voice down. Yes. Because that joker will put all type of stuff in your head and you meditate on it. <laughs> and so we need to get to the point we shut it down. And so, listen to me because when people join the church, I feel like joining the church, I put something on post the other day. Somebody was talking about should people that visit the church uh, uh, that visit faithfully versus members have the same right. First of all, visitors don't have the same right as people that have made a commitment. And a person can be a visitor for five years. There's some things that they just don't have the right to do. And the example I use is that there's a big difference between dating and being married. See, when I'm just your girlfriend or I'm your boyfriend, guess what? There's certain privileges that you don't get that come along with when you make that commitment. At least it shouldn't be so. But let me tell you what the problem is in the world today. People get the milk for free. So if they're constantly getting the milk for free, they ain't got to worry about buying the cow. But if things are done in decency and order, they know that, guess what? I can't get that milk until I make a commitment. And so there are some benefits, amen, that come with marriage. And I always talk about People that visit the church is like dating the church. But eventually, when are you going to make a commitment and marry your church? When are you going to get to a point where you are ready to own up to this thing publicly and be like, this is my place. This is where I want to be. And so there's a major difference. And so when you think about joining the church is like becoming married to the church, married to the pastor, married to your brothers and sisters, married. Marriage involves commitment. And how many of y'all know a lot of people don't want to get married because of all the work Amen. that it involves? That's right. <laughs> they don't want the responsibilities. <clears throat> Hear me in the spirit on this. Okay. In the natural, who usually struggles more with getting married, the man or the woman? The man. Because he know, huh, some of them feel like it's a death walk. <laughs> man, you know, Martin, I got to get all this out of my system. This is my life. You know, <laughs> you know, you know it, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It ain't a sentence, amen? But check this out in the spirit. Just like in the natural, it's hard for men to commit to marriage. Look around in the church. Hard for men to commit to God. Hard for men to commit angel. It's hard. And so when you look at that thing in the spirit and in the natural, it carries over. But when a person finally makes a commitment and they understand all that it entails, your spouse may get on your everlasting nerves sometimes. You don't want to talk with him. You don't want to sleep in the bed with her. <laughs> and if you're in the bed, they better not put their toe on you. <laughs> but at the end of the day, despite all of that that you're feeling, you stay together. Because you know, this ain't ongoing. Today I ain't feeling you. Tomorrow I might be feeling you. But today... I don't even want to see you. Your voice is irritating me. I mean, that's real. So guess what? It's the same thing in the church. The bottom line is you won't go through stuff. But guess what? Don't run. So divorcing your church at the first sign of disappointment is a mark of immaturity. Can I say that? If you divorce your spouse at the first sign of an issue, that's a mark of immaturity because you ain't know what you was getting into. You didn't understand what marriage really entailed. Rubbing your life with another human being. Do we realize at the end of the day, all our issues deal with just people? Yes. Mm -hmm. People. Yes. People. 
When you know people, Everywhere. when you know people, you just get to dealing with them a little different. Okay. And so, divorcing your church at the first sign of disappointment is a mark of immaturity. Every single church has its own set of weaknesses and problems. Every church. I don't care how grand it may be. I don't care how awesome it may be. I don't care how powerful the leader may be. Every single church, y'all. Has his own set of issues. Me and my husband, we got the bomb marriage. The bomb. Okay? The bomb <laughs> marriage. But how many of y'all know we still got our own set of weaknesses and issues? Yeah. Pray for us. He said, pray for me. <laughs> I sidetrack. I'm getting back to my what I was about to say. But I was thinking about that just the other night. And we were just sitting in the room, you know. And I think I had been gone. Or he was just like, you know. You know, I, I basically just, just, just missing it. So we was just playing with each other, and I'm just leaning on him, and he just leaning on me and stuff. And I just bust out laughing. I said, "We just really like each other. We still and just enjoy each other's company. We just silly, but it's it's the simple things that make you appreciate who you are with. And it should be the same thing about your own church. It should be the simple things that make you appreciate your church. It should be the simple things that make you appreciate your brother and sister. The fact that, guess what? When you weren't here, they thought about you and they checked on you. That should mean something to you. Like, oh, they care about me. And so, bottom line is, there was a pastor named Dietrich. Bonhoeffer that said, if we do not give thanks daily for the Christian fellowship, our churches in which we have been placed, even when there is no great experience, no discoverable riches, but much weakness, small faith, and difficulty, if on the contrary, we keep complaining that everything is miserable and petty, then we hinder God from letting our fellowship grow. It makes you wonder sometimes if the growth sometime in a place is stunted because of how you may put your mouth on your own church. Because if you put your mouth on your own church, I promise you, you ain't trying to tell nobody to come. So you got to ask yourself, am I really thankful for my church? Do I really love where I fellowship? On the days when they get on my nerve, do I still love them? We'll have our little moments, our Holy Ghost disagreements. Mm -hmm. And what we like to do when, the, it's crazy, but when the other one is mad and say, but you love me, don't you? It's like right now I'm so mad I don't even want to answer that question. But yes, despite how I'm feeling, yes, I still love you. You got to be able to say about your own church, even when people get on your nerve, do you still really love your place of worship with all the weaknesses, with the things that we lack. Guess what? In any relationship, there's good and there's what? Bad. And another way to keep the unity of the peace is to choose to encourage rather than criticize. Choose to encourage rather than criticize. To criticize means to find faults or to point faults out. And to encourage means to inspire with carriage, spirit, or hope. Unfortunately, it is easy for people to be negative. Yes, it, is. it is easy for people to point out the negative things instead of pointing out positive. It's so easy. Solomon and Elise, come here. I just need to use y'all as an example. Come here. Quick, 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 quick. Quick, quick, quick. Quick, quick. <laughs> Lord, let this go right the way I see it in my spirit. <laughs> All right. Look at your wife. All right. Tell me three things that she do to make you mad sometimes. You love her, but tell me three things. Did she do to make you mad sometimes? Oh. Talk loud, go ahead. Open her eyes. Open her eyes? Oh, wow. Oh, oh okay. So like, like mm -hmm. that? Okay, what else? And I pay, paying attention sometimes when I'm talking to her. Okay. Oh. Talk too much, open her eyes, all this eye stuff. 
and not paying attention when she, you talk to her, right? Tell me three things you like. Oh. <laughs> Prime example, y'all can sit down. Oh I'm just saying. Wow. <laughs> no, and guess what? That they It worked the way I saw it in the spirit. Now guess what? I promise you, he can give me some things that he do like about it. But do you see how quick it is and how easy it is for us to pick out the negative? But when it comes down to picking out something positive, it's like, okay, I got to think about this. Okay, why do I like my church? Um, why is it? And if I say, what is it that you don't like a church? You brought your church, you could probably say this, this, this. Now, what, what do you like? Um, let me see. I'll get back to you on that. Prime example, because that's how we are. And so... In order to keep the unity and the peace in your church, sometimes choose to encourage rather than to criticize. For those that are quick to criticize, know that it is easier to stand on the sidelines mm -hmm. in your church. Sometimes people come to a church, they're part of church, but they'll never do nothing in the church. But they always got something to say on the sidelines. Okay? So it's easier to stand on the sidelines and take shots at those who are serving than it is to get involved and make contribution. Let me use a natural example because this football season, huh? I love football fans. And I love the game of football. But the football fans are just like people in the church that ain't doing nothing. They're sitting on the side. Because guess what? The fans are complaining about the players out there on the field. Man, why did you do that? You know, you should have did this and all this stuff. You ain't even in the game. <laughs> I promise you If you was in the game You would do what you thought was best And somebody gonna criticize what you do But the fans got so much mouth And ain't playing nothing If you put them in the game They wouldn't even know what to do But yet They got all the words On the sideline Same thing in the church and so my motto is, don't just point out problems, pre present some solutions, get involved. When you think about it, a critical spirit is a costly vice, amen? A habitual and unusually trivial defect or shortcoming, coming. it's a problem. As we saw with Cora and the crew, they had a critical spirit. Miriam had a critical spirit, and we saw what it cost her and what it cost him. Cora and all those with him. And so it is the devil's job to blame Complain and criticize members of God's family. He is the accuser of the brethren. We have to keep that in mind. And so anytime we do the same, we are being, anytime we do the same thing over and over again, and we get caught up in the same thing, criticizing all over and over again, we are being duped into Satan's work, doing his work for him. He just drops stuff in your spirit and gets you going. And guess what? Now you got division. There's no unity and things of that nature. He back like, yep, that's what I want because I don't want no church to be unified. I don't want nobody to be on one accord. Because guess what? When people are one accord, they're like the individuals when they was trying to build the Tower of Babel up to heaven. God said, I got to destroy this thing right here. He said, because these individuals, anything that they put their mind to, they're capable of doing it. Now, they had the wrong spirit with trying to build the tower into heaven, but he saw the oneness of those people. Because when people are on one accord, there's nothing that can stop them. So if we, MBTT, are on one accord to protect our church, then there's nothing that should stop us when we see something trying to come and bring about division and unity. One mind, one spirit. And so... People can actually criticize folks so much that it makes them want to give up and quit. Sometimes, you know, you just feel like, what's the use of trying? I mean, I can't do nothing right. Not that Mary spirit. We ain't talking about that. Amen. That's a whole nother spirit. Amen. They say, I can't do nothing right. But the bottom is sometimes somebody can criticize you so much, it do make you want to quit and give up. So let us be mindful of what we actually do. Another way to keep unity and peace is refuse to listen to gossip. Shut it down. Refuse to listen to gossip. And gossip is a person who habitually reveals personal or sensational facts about others. A person who spreads rumors or idle, fruitless tales. You don't want to be a gossiper. And you don't want to be an individual that, guess what, listens to gossip, especially if you know your assignment is to protect your church. 
You don't want to listen to anything ill will. Listening to gossip is like accepting stolen property. You just as guilty. You wasn't the one that went and stole it, but you just as guilty as the one that actually did it. And so it makes you just as guilty of the crime. And so you need the courage, amen, when somebody begins to gossip to, to you and say, hold up, first of all, because, you know, it's a trick because, you know, sometimes you want, is this gossip or is it not gossip? What's your purpose for talking about it? That's what you got to ask yourself. Why, why are you bringing it up? Is it really to try to help the situation or is it just one of them, girl, let me tell you what you, let me just tell you what happened. We got to be mindful. And as ladies, y'all know as ladies, it's a struggle. Because we talk. You can hear a church mouse up in this camp. Ain't saying that. All these ladies, all these gossiping ladies is silent right now. But everybody been guilty of gossiping before. Hello? You been guilty before? I want to see your hands if you've been guilty of gossiping. I don't believe you. You may have been three years old and gossip about something. I think every person has shared somebody else's business with no purpose. The reality of it is, that's what it is. Sharing somebody else's personal or sensational facts about other people. And so, you want to shut it down. And so you need the courage when individuals begin to boss, gossip to say, please stop. Mm -mm. What's your purpose? I don't want to hear this because guess what? Hearing the wrong stuff can taint your spirit. Got to be mindful. So just say, no, I don't want to hear this. I don't need to know this. And if they come to you about somebody else, say to them, well, have you talked to that person about that? Instead of coming to me, have you talked to them? And you better understand, people who gossip to you yeah. about others yeah. will yeah. gossip about you to other people. You better believe it. Proverbs 2019 in LT, it says, a gossip goes around telling secrets, so don't hang out with chatter. The fastest way to end a church or a small group conflict is to lovingly confront those who are gossiping and insist that they stop it. Confront it, stop it, basically shut it down. Another way to keep unity and peace in the church is to practice God's method for conflict resolution. The Bible tells us that, guess what? If we have an ought with our brother or sister, go to him. Talk to him. Shut it down. It's been times that I've had to say, look, I need to address this and bring this out right now because I don't need the devil messing my mind. So I, I need to address this right now because I know how the enemy works. And so if I'm feeling some kind of way, then guess what? I should come to you. Mm -hmm. In the midst of me coming to you, we can work out some things. Amen. But if I don't come to you about what it is that I'm feeling, guess what? My mind will constantly play that thing over and over like a broken record. To then my heart becomes bitter towards you and vice versa. And so we got to be mindful. And guess what? People don't do that. People have issues with people in their church for whatever reason, and they don't go talk to them. And that thing festers, and it gets out of control. People of God, we have to do better. And finally, another way to keep unity and peace is to support your pastors and leaders, and we talked about that. There are no perfect leaders but know that God gives leaders the responsibility and the authority to maintain the unity in the church. And oftentimes pastors have the unpleasant task of serving as a mediator yep. between hurt, conflicting members of the church. Yep. Individuals that are going through that. We have to play mediator sometimes. And so leaders are also given the, hit this word, impossible. What does impossible mean? No, what does the word impossible mean? Can't be done. Can't be done. Hello? We agree with that? Yeah. Listen to this. Leaders also are given the impossible task of trying to make everybody happy. Everybody. Even Jesus couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But guess what? 
We are given the impossible task to try to keep everybody in the church happy. And it ain't happening. Because there's going to be somebody that just ain't going to like something that you do. Something that you say. But do y'all know that's what we try to do? We want to keep the peace. We want the people to be happy. But it's impossible. And so, obeying your leaders keeps them in a good place. They are accountable to God and will give an account of how they have watched over your soul. And so when it comes to pastors and leaders dealing with divisive people, they must heed instructions. Instructions that come in the word of God. First of all, they should avoid arguing. As a leader, a leader should never get to a point where they argue with anybody. You don't get into an argument with the sheep. You just don't do that. Leaders, they are to gently teach the opposition, those that are in opposition while praying that they change. How many of y'all know Jesus knew Judas was amongst the crowd, but he ministered to them all the same? He had the 12, and he knew whose heart was it. Oh, Jesus the Christ. Okay. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to keep going. Okay. Oh, Jesus. And that's the thing when you in... Oh, live stream. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 If anybody been looking at Pastor Solange's post lately, they know what I'm talking about. Okay, they are to warn those that are argumentative. They are to rebuke those that who are disrespectful of leadership. <laughs> And they are to cut off or remove, if necessary, divisive people from the church if they ignore the warnings. Amen. Okay. 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 We protect the church when we are those who do And so, pastors and elders need the members' prayers, encouragement, appreciation, and love. Bottom line, I'm ending right here. A house divided will not stand. Nobody wants to be a part of anything where there is no love, no peace, no unity. This is not my church. This is our church. And when we truly take ownership of something that uh, we will treat it well. Okay. The world needs the church. And when they come in, they should see a difference. An environment that they look forward to coming to full of people that they look forward to seeing. God blesses churches that are unified. When God has a bunch of baby believers he wants to deliver, he looks for the warmest incubator church where he can, that he can find. Ask yourself, what are you doing personally to make your church family more warm and loving? Ask yourself, what am I personally doing to protect the unity in my church family? We thank God for this word. We thank God for those of you all that have tuned in on today to find out more about our ministry. Please go to www.mbttministries.com. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. <laughs>